Well, good morning and welcome to the Election Assistance Commission's Legend of Election series. Today I'm joined by Doug Lewis, the former executive director of the Election Center and all-around election guru. Doug, thank you for being here with us today. Glad to be here. Uh, today I just want to talk to you about your experiences with election officials, your time uh, at the Election Center, and how this profession has changed. I know you spent a lot of time uh, working to professionalize uh, the election profession. First, can you start, how has the election profession changed in the time you started at the Election Center uh, until today? Matt, I th biggest change is, is, is professionalism. You know, over the last 50 years, I mean, there's, when you look at the long-term history of elections, you got in some cases uh, good history and in some cases not so good history because it, it was used in ex as an extension of people in power to control their access to power. And so for us to grow out of that, and pretty much the whole civil rights movement helped us get beyond that. But at the same time, we were still not at the point where resources or training or preparation was done. So where we are now, 50 years later from the civil rights kind of era uh, to here, we are light years different. Uh, there is, there's more education. There is more understanding and history and procedures and practices and, and knowing why you do something rather than it's just because we always did it, you know. Um, it's more looked at as a process instead of, again, just a series of tasks that we learn and we do by rote. Mm -hmm. Now the people that look at it look at it as a process to say, what's going to best serve the voters? How do we get to the point that the voter has a good experience at this and we still, our principal job is not really to make others happy, but our principal job is to make sure the election is an accurate reflection of however the public wants to choose its leaders. So That's what we do. So in this time, in this light years change, what are the three things that, that you would say, these are the three biggest changes that have brought about this service to the voters and to ensure that the, the election uh, can be uh, trusted and the results are, uh, you know, trustworthy results. What are, the, what are the three things you put your finger on that have changed? Well, one of those is, is I think you start learning once you actually get into the professional side of it. Mm -hmm. All of us get here either by the fact that we are elected or somebody is elected and hires us or that we're appointed by an elected official to do the, the process of election administration. So you start off that there's always going to be some element and component of political consideration when you do this. What you have to learn to do over the period of time you're here is to get beyond that, to get to the point that you understand partisanship. If you have a partisan bent to an election, you don't really have democracy. You know, what you've done then is shaped the process so that it favors one party over another. That's not democracy. And so what we've been able to do, it seems to me, over this period of this last 50 years, and particularly this last 25, 30 years, is, is to change that attitude so that people understand if they do this job, they're the referees. Mm -hmm. They're the referees of the system. They, they can't be active participants. They can't be actively engaged in campaigns for their party or their candidates, because if they do, then they pervert democracy. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the huge, huge changes. I think part of, the, uh, part of this is, is we certainly have better education in terms of, even if you're not talking about formal schooling education, we certainly have better professional education in the program than we ever had before. Uh, sort of again, in, in the past, it was learned by doing, learned by the fact that somebody else did it for you, and that's what you did. Now we're at the point where we say, wait a minute, you gotta think this through. This is, this is, this is all about learning how to, do the things that remove barriers, how to make this process actually work better, how to make sure that when you do it, you have a reason for doing it, and, and that that reason can be measured, can be looked at, can be quantified. You can learn how to make improvements. Again, one of the things that didn't happen before, I'll tell you, when, you know, uh, some 40 years ago, when, when I first started to try to run elections, we had no manuals. Mm -hmm. 
There was not, you, you look around and you say, where's the manual? What manual? There is no manual. You know, so learning to do procedures, learning to understand that you do practices for a reason, and there are reasons that you don't do things as well, you know, so that you understand that you're always going to be able to back up and explain to anybody why you did what you did. Your ultimate objective as an election administrator, as much as I, as much as I want voters to always be happy about this, your ultimate objective is to make sure that the election is accurate. That's first, because you're now talking about the voters themselves picking their leaders. So it doesn't matter what we think as individuals or as administrators. It's all about what voters want. And, that, and then the second part of that is to make sure the process is fair. If elections are not fair, democracy ultimately fails. I want to touch on uh, something you said about the professionalization and the manuals. What core competencies does an election administrator have to have? What are the core skills that, that an election administrator either needs to come into the job with or develop uh, on the job? Well, <laughs> Matt, over the years, I, I, I will say to you, what I learned, the kind of people that, that we attract and who stay in this, first you've got to be passionate. You got to be, have a lot of passion about elections. You got to be someone who, because resources are not always here, governments are real good about giving lip service to actually putting resources to elections, but more often than not, they're not going to put a lot. And so, if you don't have passion for what you do, so that you can make it work, even if the resources are not there, you're not going to do very well at this. Secondly, I would say to you, most of our people are control freaks. They are just, they are, you know, they're detail people. They don't, they want to look at everything that could possibly go wrong, and they don't want it to go wrong, and therefore, just by sheer force of will, they're going to make sure it doesn't go wrong. There's probably a little bit of thrill junkie in this, uh, because every time you have an election, you put your name your reputation, your honesty, your ethics out for the public to measure as to whether or not you're actually doing what you ought to be doing. And so there's some of that. More than anything, it's attention to detail. This is, this is maybe one of the biggest detail jobs you will ever see. Details and logistics, you know. Mm -hmm. And so if you have those, those skills, and you're interested in that, then that you'll do well here. Mm -hmm. I want to take you back to kind of how your career started. You didn't start in elections. Right. Uh, you started uh, in IT, correct? Well, I, yeah, actually, I started in, in <laughs> when I first started, but even before I got out of college, I was running campaigns, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, right. that's, that's, that's how a lot of us get here, mm -hmm. you know, is, um, and in campaigns, you have to learn how the process works. Yep. You have to know all the laws. You have to know all the practices that that election administrator is going to do so that you know whether or not you can challenge something or whether or not it's actually going to be done the way you think it's going to be done so your candidate has the right attitude. But I think the biggest part of it was getting into it and finding out, you know, in some cases, I'm sure there were parts of America that were very detailed all along, but... but uh, but that lack of having practices and procedures and writing drove me nuts. Mm -hmm. And so I'm one of those guys who I can't help it. I've got to have, you know, I want structure. <laughs> Give me structure, you yep. know, so that we can make this work. And so that's kind of where we got. So that, that actually leads into my question, which is you get into elections. What were the first things that you wanted to bring about as far as change, concepts, ideas, that would help improve the, the uh, election administration across the country. What would you come into this uh, thinking, uh, these are the, the areas I want to focus on? Well, you know, the first thing is, is you've got, you got to be willing to say failure is not an option, mm -hmm. you know. And secondly, unlike almost any other profession out there, time is always the enemy in an election. Mm -hmm. You can't create more time. Election day is election day. If you're not prepared, there's no, we'll slide the schedule two weeks or four weeks or whatever. You know, election day is coming. And so from the very beginning of each process, you know that time is the enemy. 
What you try to do in that is to use your time wisely, to think it through wisely. Part of that is training, 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 <laughs> so that you know what to expect. And when you learn from the experiences of others around the country, when you see what actually happens and what can go wrong, go wrong, go wrong, you then are able to say, how do I prevent that from happening here? What would I do if it happened to me? You know, what if the tornado was coming through and was going and and was going to blow away all the stuff? What do I do? What, you know, what am I going to do if the, the equipment fails? What am I going to do if the electricity doesn't work? All those things, you know, listening to how others have handled some of those really is good. And so that broadening that nationally. See, for a long time we were all little individual islands. Um, even within states, uh, uh, Kansas City might do it very different than Jefferson County, Missouri, you know. Uh, and so what you hoped for is, is that by all of us meeting together, all of us understanding together, all of us educating ourselves together, that we begin to share some information and we say, oh, I can take the best of that, I can take the best of that, and get better. And that's what we've done. Thank God that's what we've done. Mm -hmm. The profession is much better today than it's than it was in, in, in our long-term history on this. I, I want to take uh, one of those experiences that uh, all election officials that were around at that time learned from, and that's the 2000 election. Oh, uh, boy. What were those lessons learned, and how are we better off today than we were in 2000? Well, look, nobody, once you have a tie election, virtually a tie election, nobody's going to come out looking good, you know, because when uh, hordes and, uh, of, of news media and lawyers and campaign types descend on you, every flaw is going to be exposed. And no election in America is perfect. Uh, you know, I, I used to say the only perfect election is the one in which the voters don't know how many mistakes we actually made. You know, they, they didn't become public knowledge. But this is, the biggest part of it is simply is understanding that you first have got to go back and figure out root causes. And unfortunately, when we first started after election 2000 looking at it, we were focusing on a whole bunch of things that didn't cause the problem. Mm -hmm. Eventually, like we finally what? got it. Like what? what well, were we, we, we were on? we were always concerned. We were absolutely certain that it was just the voting equipment that did that. Well, when you looked at the actual results, everybody focused on punch cards. But where the biggest disparity was was in central count optical scan. You saw far more errors in that than you did anywhere. You know, and so it's learning to go through this and deconstruct what actually happened and quit focusing just on what sounds politically palatable, but get down to root causes. The whole problem, if you want to do this, is you've got to fix the issues. You don't want to fix the symptoms, you want to fix the root causes. If you do those, then the voter and the process and the candidates and the media all benefit from that. So in your mind, what were the central issues in election 2000, and, and have we fixed them? How, how have we addressed them? Well, one of the ones was is, is that god-awful sight of counting boards sitting there trying to determine voter intent. Now, you're making this up as you go along after an election. That's not a good, that's not a good situation. Had we all had instructions so that all of us... Um, that were in Florida or any other state that ends up with these ties. And Florida just happened to be the example if it was the first time in our lifetimes that it happened in a presidential. But we've had states where close elections for governor or United States senator or congressman or what have you. And so you see these. But the, but the problem that you get to in, in some of this is, is that um, you didn't get to know what was actually going to be counted as a vote before you started counting the vote. Mm -hmm. So what you've got is you've got one county is saying, oh yeah, that's a vote, and the next county over saying, oh no, it isn't. Mm -hmm. 
That's not fair to candidates. That's not fair to the parties, not fair to the process. It's not fair to the voters. And so it seemed to me, they used to tell us that uh, voter intent was a standard. Well, voter intent's not a standard. You know, one guy said to me, I know a vote when I see it. Well, if you know a vote when you see it, you can define it. Uh -huh. You know, so that before an election, voters know what you're going to count. So that you then don't look like you're making it up on the fly as you do it. And so that was one of the things that was absolutely stunning to me. Clearly, we learned the flaws of uh, punch card voting. I mean, we certainly learned just where this, you know, you tend to think of it as, as being one of those that it's such a simple system and such a simple process, you can't really make errors with it. And we discovered that you could indeed make errors with it. But we also found on optical scan, we learned a whole bunch of things about optical scan. And optical scan is simply where you take a ballot, you take a marker on the ballot, you mark a vote, you run it through a counting machine that actually reads that uh, on the ballot and counts it except that none of us really knew the extent to which voters could actually do things you didn't know they could do. You Can't know? underestimate well, the skill Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, so you, you get to the point that you say, okay, we need to know more about that. And yeah. so as a result of election 2000, let me tell you, all across the country, we all started saying, okay, how do we, how do we contain this? How do we get to the point that we're better than this mm -hmm. so that we can make voters make fewer errors on this? And so we looked at lots of that. We didn't know at the time that, quite frankly, not having a second chance to improve your ballot, that is, again, central count optical scan, meant that so many more votes could not be counted. Now, the news media always said, and the politicians always said, we were discarding ballots, or we were, we were somehow uh, broken ballots, or lost ballots. We don't have lost ballots. You have lost votes. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can't qualify a specific vote, then you, you, on that particular race, you then discard at least it because you can't determine fairly. So you let a court do that, but we can't. One of, one of the focuses of, of HAVA and After 2000 that addresses some of this was the, the modernization of the process and new yes. voting equipment, right? Right. right. Uh, and then uh, issues and questions came up around touchscreen voting machines and even, even the OPSCAN uh, voting systems. And so uh, have we addressed those problems with technology? Is technology the way to address those problems? Or in fact, uh, did we think that that was a solution, but we created more problems? Yes and no. I, I'm sorry to yeah, answer no, it that perfect. way, but, but because elections are about who governs, because they're about power, because they're about who controls government as a result of it, we have not been able to use the latest technology in elections like almost all other parts of society do. I mean, society can use their cell phone and their smartphone to make bank deposits and do anything they want to do, but you can't apply that in voting because there's distrust. And so what we have done in elections is, is we know that from a technological standpoint, we're always going to be behind the curtain. We're going to be at the point of where politicians' comfort zone is such that you can do whatever you can do. Mm -hmm. Right now, we've been forced back. Instead of, you know, we started heading off that electronic voting was going to be pretty much the answer, particularly for the disabled, and, and, and paper ballots still cause a real problem if, if you've got disabilities. But uh, electronic voting was faster. It truly was more difficult to manipulate. And so that was a, an advantage to it, which then got turned on its head to become a disadvantage. But, but, but there was distrust factor. Distrust factor is what I should have said. A distrust factor that that, that machine, that I can prove to you that somebody didn't manipulate mm -hmm. that. And so we got into that. And, and as a result, I think, uh, honestly, uh, on the election side, we're always probably going to be 15 or 20 years behind the rest of society in terms of technological advances. Um, now, as 
young people come into this process, the new generations of young people who get used to doing everything electronically, at some point they're going to insist that we do more things electronically, including voting. And so I, I don't say that to, to start a whole new round of arguments <laughs> on this. It is just simply a matter of what's coming. And so if it's coming, we as responsible elections officials have got to minimize the risks of it. We've got to find ways to make sure that it is safe and secure and that people's comfort zone is reached. Because otherwise, I mean, there are, there are groups of people who would have us for the next 150 years do nothing but paper. Well, that, that's probably unrealistic. This actually goes to, to my next question, which take it out of just the technology realm. One of the challenges that election officials uh, struggle with is the desire and need to provide uh, options and access and ease of process, right? Uh, whether it's through early voting, whether it's through uh, various uses of technology and information, while at the same time providing a level of security uh, and, and uh, assurance that the process has integrity to it. What advice would you give to election officials as they're weighing choices within their office, whether they're technology-based or just uh, procedurally based, uh, to, to create a process that has integrity but provides the level of access that voters now expect? Well, I th I, the key, honestly, on this is, is you're going to have to find out what the comfort zone is of the people that are making the true decisions. Most elections administrators can propose things, but they're truly not the ones who are making the decisions. State legislators are principally the ones who are going to make decisions about what can or cannot be used in election within a given state. And so you have to know that if you're proposing something that there's a comfort zone on both political parties' parts, uh, or in, if you happen to be in a state that's got multiple political parties, that, that people buy into that. Elections are all about confidence. Confidence that the process is fair. Confidence that the process is going to work. Confidence that the process, at least if it doesn't result in my guy winning, I still believe it was a fair election, mm -hmm. you know. And so for that to happen, the election administrator has got to be able to know what his public, what his policymakers, what his opinion leaders will actually accept and buy into before you go forward mm -hmm. some of this. Second part of that is, is though, we've applied a lot of things. I mean, for instance, it was elections administrators that brought into being electronic poll books. Now, we have an obligation, for instance, if we're going to use electronic poll books where we know what the voter is going to do, we have obligations to make sure it works and works well before we actually implement it. Mm -hmm. but, but that's an application that's there. One of the applications that some of our states are able to use, but not all states because of politics, political decision making, is we know that the poll workers make far fewer errors if they take a driver's license and swipe the driver's license, which then tells you exactly the residence of where the person is. You'll know exactly what ballot to assign to them, what precinct they're in right on down the line. And so more, fewer errors are made if you do that. But that's not always politically palatable because there are some folks who say, well, no, wait a minute, if you do that, that's voter ID. And, and so you get into this sort of thing. So some things that make sense administratively, we can't do because they're not politically acceptable. So how do, what it, as someone who has, you know, uh, spoken to congressmen, state legislators, county commissioners, what, what advice do you have for the election official that wants to go in and have these conversations? Because so often what I hear from election officials is they're, they're not even really interested in my view on this. How, how do you get the policymakers to understand or get interested in the election officials point of view on these issues? Well more often than not uh, part of this is, is if, you're, if you're within a state your state association uh, needs to be working with, with elected politicians particularly in the state legislature at all times. Mm -hmm. 
to show that you have an understanding of how the process works. Unfortunately, we happen to be in a profession that if anybody ever ran for office, they believe they know about election administration. And more often than not, they're wrong, wrong, mm -hmm. wrong. So but how do we educate them? What well, steps it's, do you this, this, is, this is a process. You've got to work at it, for one thing. You've got to work at it really hard. Because the political types within each state really want it to be the way they want it, not necessarily the way administrators want it. If we sit down, you're going to talk to several folks uh, in this series. And if we sat down with all of those folks as elections administrators, and we said, we're going to sit around a table and we're going to design an election process, it wouldn't look like what we've got now. How would it look? Well, it'd certainly be more process oriented. It, it certainly would be more streamlined in terms of the ways we can do things and the things that we know that that create problems in elections. But but we can't do that simply because political groups, political organizations, political individuals want what they want, and they tend to lock that down in law, even if it makes no sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, it makes sense to them from a political standpoint, but it makes no sense in, in election administration. So one of the things you have to learn to do if you get in this profession is, is some of it doesn't make sense, and we got to figure out how to make it work, even if it doesn't make sense. And, and, and so you can't really get mad at the local election official if something doesn't work very well. More often than not, it's because the politicians themselves designed a system that is patchwork. It, it was trying to achieve political advantages that don't make sense from a democracy standpoint. And so you, you just you learn to work with it. You do the best that you can do given the rules that you're given. I had an election official say to me one time that the, the phrase that best sums up election administration is you play the hand you're dealt, right? And, exactly. And, and that's the best you can do. Exactly. You, you said you you can't blame the, the local election administrator. The reality we know is they get blamed all the time, right? And so yeah. my question to you is, uh, I know you've talked to and worked with many local administrators who are in a tough situation. Something's gone wrong, you know, the process is, is being questioned. Uh, what advice do you give to them while they're in the midst of that challenge, whatever it might be, uh, to get through the other side? What, what is the advice you'd give to someone that, that's uh, currently in a, a, a controversy or a challenge regarding uh, election administration and either their office uh, had a role in it or didn't, but the, their, the, their process is the one being questioned? Well, when it first happens, my advice to everyone is just tell everyone to shut up for two minutes. Nobody talks to you for two minutes so that your brain can process what the problem is. Mm -hmm. Once you have that two-minute lead time to just think through, and it's amazing how fast your brain works in that two minutes when you're facing disaster, you can then begin to structure and start to sort through, okay, what could possibly have caused this? Because you want to know really what caused it. You don't want to guess. You don't want to go to the news media and say, you know, we think this is what happened because if it turns out that that wasn't what happened at all, then you really don't look good. And so the key is, is, to, is first just containment of what is the issues and how do we go about fixing it now so that we can proceed in, with confidence. I think part of this also is, is learning to compartmentalize what you know over training tells you have been things that have gone wrong. We've, as a profession, because we talk to each other nationally now, we go to training, you know, through organizations like the Election Center and IACRIOT and NACO and NACREC and, you know, right on down the line, all the organizations that are out there, NASAD, NAS, uh, we look at this and we talk to each other and we say, here's what happened to us and guess what we learned. Well, you know, that's good stuff because what it means is, is you're better able to react to that. Now, part of this is, the biggest part of this is, political pressure starts being applied as soon as the disaster or the event or the occurrence has happened to change your procedures immediately and do this. Every time I've ever had to defend an election official in America, it's because they reacted to that pressure rather than following their procedures. 
procedures are developed in a time of dispassionate review. You know, you're sitting down calmly and you're thinking through all the things that could affect any of this. And you build a procedure that's based on good practice and on fairness and, and on application of law and application of learning. And so don't change those. During an election, don't change those. If you change those, you're almost always going to get hit with lawsuits and allegations of partisanship and right on down the line. The time to change procedures is after an election is over with, not during one, not just before one. Unfortunately, we get legislatures that don't understand it. We get legislatures who want a political objective in an election cycle, and so therefore they pass something in May expecting us to make it happen in November when that leads more often than not to big disasters. And so if you can get legislatures to say this will apply after this election cycle, that's a good deal then, because then you can think it through. You know, mm -hmm. you've, you've, and, and look, if you institute a new voting system, if you institute a new practice or a new procedure, it usually takes you two or three elections. And I don't mean, I'm not talking about gubernatorial elections or congressional elections. It's usually just two or three good-sized elections for you to figure out, what, how do I need to adjust my practices or procedures? And once you do that, you've got it pretty well down. You, you know, nothing's perfect the very first time you run it, but you learn your lessons as you go through. This is new, this is something we're doing new. If you do that, then things work out pretty well. And people just gotta give us patience, allow us enough patience to get us there so that we can fix it. This is one of the things, by the way, that happened in election 2000. Both sides of the aisles, Democrats and Republicans, finally understood that we couldn't change everything all at once, mm -hmm. that it needed to be phased in, that it needed to be staged in. And I'm going to say to you, members of both parties and their leadership were aware that we could break the system if we tried to do too much at once. Mm -hmm. And as a result, responsible leadership came out of Congress. I was, you, you could have knocked me over with a feather. Because truth of the matter is, is when we first started looking at these issues, everything that came out of Congress was super hyper partisan. Republicans wanted one thing, Democrats wanted something totally different. Mm -hmm. By the time we got done, they all began to say, we just want the process to work well for Americans. And as a result of that, we got a pretty good deal. Yeah. So as you look back, over the years and reflect. Share with me one um, instance, one incident uh, where you could point to and say, man, I learned a, a really good lesson there, that, that lesson learned uh, that could be shared uh, with the community. I wish I could tell you that there was just one. <laughs> I, you know, I, I really do. I, this is a profession where it changes every time we have an election. You know, I mean, you learn something new. Um, I learned over, you know, I was at this for more than 40 years. I will say to you, I don't think any two elections were ever the same. Voters always proved to me that they could do things we didn't, any of us think they could do, even if you try to build every practice known to mankind to make sure nothing can go wrong, it still can go wrong. Um, Part of that is, is I think, particularly in presidential elections, we draw out the inexperienced, the, the, non, the voter who has never gone to the polls before or the inexperienced voter who comes in, and they do things that, that just don't happen ordinarily, mm -hmm. you know, and so learning those uh, things. I even learned, you know, I will tell you, there, there, was, a, there was an outfit uh, in the country where they had really good staff good election staff, good people, good leadership. They had resources. And they forgot to put some things in with the equipment that actually made the equipment function. And so when they opened up on election day, no polling place could actually allow voting to go on because they'd forgotten to put this stuff in. This is, this is that wasn't malintent, you know, mm -hmm. it wasn't, it wasn't, you could say it was bad administration, and, the, and there may be indeed some of that, you know, because you didn't check every last detail, but it was one of those where it was just totally unexpected. And so how do you fix that? And more than that, 
learning from that so that how do you get a thousand polling sites to tell you, whoa, we're out of business all at once. You know, how do you do that? Yeah. So we had to learn some things there. Those, the beauty of this is, is that we do learn. We, we rarely make the same mistake twice. We may make those mistakes, but we rarely make the same mistake twice. And so um, that's the beauty of the profession is, is that we, you will never be bored in election administration. I was at it for 40 years. I will tell you I never lost my passion for it because it always challenges your mind. It challenges your professionalism. It challenges your brain. Mm -hmm. It challenges your honesty and your ethics and right on down the line, you know, because it can go wrong, go wrong, go wrong so many places. And so I think from the standpoint of somebody who wants to look at this and say, I want this as a profession, I want to be good at this as a profession, you'll never be bored. <laughs> so. What advice would you give a young person getting out of college, you know, graduating from a program that says, hey, this election administration uh, career is of interest to me. What, what would you tell them? Well, I'd tell them that, look, you will have a very car good career. You will not ever have to apologize for what it is you do for a living. You won't, I mean, you never have that. You're never gonna get rich. <laughs> You know, uh, you're not going to get many attaboys mm -hmm. or atta girls. You know, I mean, it's a profession where recognition for doing a job well is rarely given, but recognition for making mistakes is always front and center. Mm -hmm. You know, and so if you if you're the kind who needs recognition, positive <laughs> recognition, this may not be where you want to be. Um, if you cannot stand up to heat and intensity in the, in the sense of being examined constantly, then it may not be a profession for you. And yet at the same time, if you believe that the only way you can have faith in government is to have faith in the political system that produces that government, then you're right where you need to be, where your heart is, where your soul is, where your passion is, to make democracy work. And I'm gonna say to you, you know, we all end up probably on occasion sounding like we're super patriots or that we're a little crazy about the meaning of these flags and that um, and of the symbols of America and, and democracy itself. But it's because we actually truly do let it get in our blood. It becomes a calling. I, I used to uh, say it's sort of akin to becoming a minister, I think, you know, because you believe passionately in what you're doing. You believe passionately in how it serves humanity and who, and it serves us. It's, it's simply a way of finding a way for humans to behave freely, mm -hmm. to have choice, to be involved. And given that, it's an ideal place to be. If you're young and you want, if you want to know that you've done something good to help society, if you want to know that you've done something good to make government better and to make American lives better, this is the place to be. Yeah, that, the, the other thing I'd add and, and appreciate your reflection on is the community of election officials are a, a unique uh, group of servants uh, that share ideas, share best practices, but also bad experiences because they care so much about the process that they not only want to see their office succeed, but they want to see your office succeed and all the other election offices succeed. And I find that to be unique uh, within the election profession. Well, yeah, when you look at America, you know, we're a pretty big country. I mean, you know, 330 million uh, people, uh, you got about 180 million registered voters uh, on any given time. You got, and maybe 130 million of those will actually show up, you know, in a, in a popular presidential election. And, and so when you look at that, to make all of that happen, Realistically, there are only about 8,000 jurisdictions in America with an election administrator, even part-time, let alone full-time, mm -hmm. you know. I, I, from our best guesstimates, there are about 18,000 employees nationwide who have something to do with elections, particularly that are federal or state elections, you know, to, to make all this come together. And so when you look at that, for them to make all of this come together, 
I mean, my God, look at in a presidential year. You've got roughly 800,000 pieces of voting equipment. You've got roughly a little less than maybe about, about 190,000 precincts. You've got about a million and a half poll workers nationwide. And you're organizing all of this to happen on one day, you know. My God, generals don't have to move as much an election official moves to make an election day happen, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And a general can slide his schedule. We can't slide ours, you know. And so this is, this is what these folks go through. And for, so what I'm saying to you is, is even though we're a nationwide deal, we're a small community. There's Very. a small reservoir of people who do this. And if you look at the ones who do it full time, that's even smaller than that 18,000. And so for us to end up with a kind of democracy that we end up with is pretty amazing. We get better democracy than the nation is willing to pay for. Mm -hmm. We get better election administration than the nation is willing to actually support and sustain. And we do it because these people are passionate about it. They are passionate enough to say the election is going to be successful on my watch. Mm -hmm. And so, they, that's. Listen, I know. I know. Sometimes I sound like I'm. Uh, I'm on a soapbox on this, but let me say to you. Thank God, the people who do this job are the kinds of people who do this job because America benefits from that. No question. Last question, because it's on the mind of every election official heading into this presidential election year. What are your largest concerns, and what are your pieces of advice to, to combat those concerns for this year specifically? This is maybe the craziest year. I, listen, I'm 70 years old. I've been at this stuff for more than 50 years. I've never seen anything like this, not ever. Um, there is such misunderstanding because new people are coming out. Uh, it depends on whether it's you know the Democratic candidate or the Republican candidate. New people have come out to support those candidates that didn't exist before, you know, and so uh, and some of the other candidates that were in the primaries brought a whole bunch of folks that had not really been kind of involved, and so we have seen a lot of misunderstanding. You know, we've seen some problems in some areas where it clearly is the voters didn't understand that they can't just go in and vote for anybody, you know, in a primary. They didn't understand that in some cases they, if you were in a state where you got to register by party, they didn't understand that. So they showed up and stood in line and wanted to vote when the state law said they couldn't vote. Yep. You know, it wasn't the election officials mistake. It was state law says you can't do it. And so there, there's that misunderstanding that goes on. And so we look bad as elections administrators because of that, because it looks like it's our fault. When in, in fact, it's not our fault. It's the way the process is. But so as a result, this year has been one that's been very challenging because you've had so many passionate new voters show up as a result. I mean, my lands, the Republicans had, what, 16, 17 candidates, and the Democrats had at least two, actually. They ended up with five, I think, at one point, and settled on two for a while. And it brought lots of new people into the process who just really didn't understand. They didn't understand what the rules were, what the laws were, what, but they were passionate enough to want to participate. Mm -hmm. Managing that expectation and trying to find a way to make sure that the individuals that came out have a good experience and yet at the same time have to tell them the message that you have to tell them, I'm sorry, but the law does not allow you mm -hmm. to participate. Or I can give you a provisional ballot and let you vote it, but it's not going to count, mm -hmm. you know, simply because you're not qualified to be you know, voting in the election. That's a tough message to do, and it's a tough role in the responsibility of an election official. But again, it's back to being referee. The referee's got to tell you what the rules are. It doesn't have to say to you, I make up the rules, because that's not the deal. The referee has to say to you, here are the rules. i got to live by the rules, regardless of what the outcome is for you. And so that's tough. That's a tough message to carry. Um, and yet at the same time, we want voters, 
we want voters as elections administrators most of us don't care who wins mm -hmm. um, ultimately I mean we may care personally but we don't care professionally all we want is we want the Lord to answer our prayers don't let it be close <laughs> you know let us win this thing in a landslide so that nobody <laughs> looks at what we're doing mm -hmm. you know and because you want the voters to have who they want perfect well thank you thank not only you. for your time here this morning but for your 40 plus years of service well, uh, to this profession and, thank you. and for being willing to, to come in here and, and share your knowledge. You know, the truth is, is man, I've enjoyed it. I've had probably one of the greatest rides anybody can have. I loved what I did. I enjoyed what I did. The people who do this profession are magnificent at what they do. It's the reason that I'm glad that you and the other commissioners are doing what you do because it's very different, isn't it? Yeah. It's very, very different. different. It's very different. And, and you see the passion. You see the dedication. You see the loyalty to the process itself. You see people who want to make sure voters have a good experience. And that is so remarkable mm -hmm. that it just, it sort of fills your life with joy that you actually did something that was worthwhile. It, it absolutely, it matters. It yeah, matters. yeah. So, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate thank it. you very thank much. You. Thanks for having me.